Okay, so uh, hello everyone. So um, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, ethics and seminar, the HOS, the Hadama Foundations. Uh, so, um, so I will talk about the topological recursion. I will give a blackboard talk. Uh, I have also slides, but I think you probably it's probably easier to understand on the blackboard talk. <coughs> so. The topic contains three keywords, topological recursion, module spaces, quantum curves. Uh, well, so I will explain the three of them. Um, the topological recursion is depicted by those, uh, by those uh, pictures. Uh, and so the purpose is to see what they mean. Uh, so the topology, well, just to start, so I will start by an introduction. Uh, by, the, by introduction, uh, well, so just what it is about. So the topological recursion, I, I will write it TR, okay, is just, uh, well, for the moment, just take it as a black box, which takes an input and gives an output. It's an algorithm which takes an input and gives an output. The input is a spectral curve, which I will explain in more details later, but uh, for the moment I will just give a vague idea of what it is. First, it contains a Riemann surface, so I will take S, a spectral curve. It will contain a Riemann surface and uh, other things. Well, I mean, a Riemann surface with some structure, which I will explain. <coughs> and the output will be, uh, the output will consist uh, in what I will call invariance Sometimes I will call them the TR invariants. Uh, and they are, uh, and I will denote them uh, WGN. Well, so they are WGN of S, and they are N forms, N forms on sigma N. So it means they are differential forms. And in particular, there will be one, there will be also WG0 of S, which almost everyone denotes in fact FG of S, which will be a uh, so just well, it would be a zero form, so, so it's just a complex number. And in fact, we could also work with other fields, and it could would be just uh, an element of a field. Um, so out of that, well, so the basic invariants are the WGNs. We give a special name to the WG zeros, which are the FGs. <coughs> and out of them, we can also build other quantities. One is it will be called the Okay, the partition function, and it will depend on the parameter h bar, and it will be constructed as a formal series. In fact, log of z h bar will be a formal series. It will be exponential sum over g of h bar to the two g minus two f g of s. So z h of s. Uh, what, what is G in its nature? G and N are integers. We are just so it's a sequence of invariants. So WGN is an N form, so we have a sequence of N forms. WG0 is a zero form, it's a number, and there is a sequence uh, indexed by G. It will be related to a genus for many spaces. Of from these spaces. Well, so we define the partition function out of the, well, basically the FGs are just the coefficients in a formal series. Uh, well, in fact, the true partition function, uh, somehow this is only the perturbative part of the partition function, and there will be another quantity which I will just write theta, and which is which will be related to a theta function defined uh, from the Riemann surface sigma, uh, but I will not explicit it now. And I will also define a wave function, so 
Sai ikke bare av S. Which will be, well, ok, let me say, it will depend on a divisor. And it will be exponential sum of uh, G on N of H bar to 2 G minus 2 plus N over N factorial integral. Well, since WGN is an N form, you can integrate it on uh, N cycle and it will just be uh, N copies of the same integral. I will also explain that later. And there is also a theta term, uh, which I will not explicit now. Um, so basically, without the theta terms, it's when sigma has genus zero, you won't have theta terms. And when sigma has non genus zero, you have extra terms. Okay. And uh, so, why do that? Why do we want to consider that? So. Why do we make those definitions uh, and why they are interesting? Well, uh, they are interesting because, uh, because they have many properties and many applications. And many applications. Well, the link the link to moduli spaces is that we will show that, so link to moduli spaces, I will show you that uh, for every spectral curve, there exists a certain moduli space, which I will write MGN of S. I will define it, it will be a combinatorial moduli space. Uh, and there exists a class Lambda of S, which would be a cohomology class. <coughs> so such that WGN of S will be an integral over MGN of S of the class Lambda of S. Okay, so I'm just uh, Give you, giving you a hint of what we are going to see. So, uh, so those invariants are, so which are defined starting from a uh, Riemann surface equipped with some structure, and by just doing some uh, complex analysis on that Riemann surface, you define some objects which uh, can be written as integral over some moduli spaces, and which in many cases <laughs> correspond to some uh, interesting problems in the let's say, enumerative geometry in moduli spaces. Okay, and the link to quantization to quantum curves well, let's imagine that this Riemann surface was defined by some uh, equation P of x, y equals zero so typically a polynomial, but not only polynomial, sometimes it will be some uh, analytical function. So basically it will be a, uh, a curve embedded into C cross C or into uh, an over space, and it's given by such an equation. Then uh, the link to quantum curve is that psi will satisfy, will be annihilated by an operator, is that psi h bar is annihilated by an operator which I will call p hat h bar of x and I will call that on y hat y hat is h bar ddx so it means that p hat h bar of x y hat psi equals zero and the limit when h bar goes to zero of this p hat h bar of x y equals p of x y. So, uh, so, the link, so that's what people call a quantum curve. You start with a curve and basically you prioritize <coughs> it by changing y to an operator h bar ddx so that you have y x equals h bar. And psi is annihilated by a quantization, a quantized version of a, of a curve you started with. 
So, but just to give uh, an idea. And this is typically what people want to do in uh, like uh, TQFT, so topological quantum field theory in Hitchin systems. Yeah, that's that's where the variable x uh, and psi. Okay, I didn't write it, but it's hidden in the choice of a divisor. Okay. Okay. The, the series uh, in the exponent, it's a formal series or? It's, it's formal a, series. It's not, it will not converge. Usually. Well, uh, so far we have not really studied the Borel summability. But uh, there is some hope that <coughs> basically we, we know that WGN grows <coughs> by 2G minus 2 plus N factorial. So there is good chances that it will be more summable, but from <coughs> the moment we just define formal things, and when I say annihilated, I mean annihilated in the sense of formal series. So each term. So it means that each term is killed by the operator. So, well, another uh, interesting thing is that you will see that for. When, when we choose some nice spectral curves, so for instance in knot theory, if we choose the spectral curve to be the so-called A polynomial of a knot, uh, this, for instance, this psi h bar is supposed to realize the Jones polynomials, the, the asymptotic expansion of the Jones <coughs> polynomials. This is a conjecture, this has never, be, never been proved, but we can check it to quite high orders in h bar and it works. So, my <coughs> second part is the origin of that. Uh, it came from random matrix theory. So the reason why we were led to define this topological recursion is because of random matrices. In random matrices, you take a measure, <coughs> d mu of m, uh, well, typically we should choose one or h bar trace of v of m. And here, well, what I'm dm is in fact the product. So, uh, so on we work on the space of uh, Hermitian, Hermitian matrices of size n. Uh, d mu of n will be something like that, where this is just the product over i and j of dm i j. I mean, product over all real. Uh, well, I mean, it's just the Lebesgue measure on uh, on h n. So invariant Lebesgue measure, and I will just write it dm. So it's a it's a random matrix measure. And um, sorry, <coughs> sorry, and we want to normalize it by the partition function. So the partition function is integral over dm if the minus one over h bar trace of d of m. And uh, and then you are also interested in expectation values of different quantities, like, I don't know, trace of n to some powers, k, or things like that. Um, okay. So we are interested in such objects. And the main question which was uh, raised by people doing random matrices for many, many years is what happens when the matrix becomes large? So what happens in the large n limit? So in the large n, well, the large n behavior. And when I take large n to have a good scaling, you also want h bar with to zero. And such that, uh, well, the reference people write t equals h, h bar n is O of 1. <coughs> the reference n is called the toothed parameter. It's the toothed parameter. And so you want to work with fixed two parameters, so h bar going to zero and going to, to infinity, such that such that h bar n remains finite. And what can you say? Well, it's expected that log z should start with one over h bar square times the coefficient, which we call f zero. Well, uh, this is quite general, but then. Under certain assumptions on the measure you have, so for under certain assumptions on V, uh, it turns out that there is a series expansion which is of that form, sum over, let's say, G equals 1 to infinity of H bar to 2G minus 2 <coughs> FG. So it's not easy to prove that a given measure will lead to such an expansion, but it's been proved in a certain number of cases, and basically if you take 
very reasonable assumptions on V, you always obtain such an expansion. But the question now is, assuming such an expansion, how do you compute FG? So assuming that you have such an expansion, how can you compute FG? Well, there is uh, some equations you can write, which is basically integration by parts in this integral. That's called uh, schmier dyson equations, and which can be solved recursively in powers of h bar, and uh, which give a recursive, a recursive algorithm to compute FG. So the question is compute FG. And in fact, you don't want to compute only FG, you want to compute all sorts of expectation values. Well, if you take that sum over k multiplied by x to the minus k minus 1, and this is the same thing as writing your computing trace of x minus m to the minus 1, so it's the resolvent, and I will call that uh, w1 of x. Well, I want to make it uh, one form, so I multiply by dx times that, dx times that. So w1 of x is also some quantity you want to compute. And w1 of x is, uh, I mean, the imaginary part of w1 of x, the, the discontinuity of the resolvent, is also the <laughs> density of eigenvalues. So it's the spectrum of the... So the discontinuity of a resolvent is, the is basically the density, uh, the spectral density of a random matrix. So, uh, so when you compute the spectral density, uh, well, it has, how does it behave in the large n limit? <coughs> Sorry. So in the large n limit, so in the large n limit, you will see that if you will start with one over h bar, uh, and let me call that w zero one of x. Plus, and again, there is a series expansion, some p equals 1 to infinity of h bar to, uh, to g minus 1, wg1 of x. And people observe that each wg1, I mean each w, uh, each of those terms, is an algebraic function of x. So the most famous thing is, so if you plot the density rho of x, so which is the so let me write it h bar rho of x, which is just the discontinuity. I mean, it's more or less the same thing as w1. Uh, morally, it's the same thing. Well, to linear order, typically, you get uh, an algebraic function with a finite support. So typically, if you started with a Gaussian, a Gaussian measure here, uh, what you find is the semicircle, uh, a quadratic curve. If you start with a uh, V which is polynomial of higher degree, you will find uh, an algebraic curve of higher degree. Okay, but typically it's, uh, it's an algebraic curve. Uh, and then you start to compute the corrections, so somehow you, you want to, to compute the correction powers by powers in H bar. And when you have this full series, in fact, there could also be some exponential terms, typically minus H bar A. Well, so let me write that this way. So which corresponds to typically exponential tails of oscillations. Excuse me? To H minus H bar inverse. Sorry, in, yes, H bar inverse, of course. Yeah, <coughs> one over H bar. So typically you can do that, and these quantities will contain uh, the non-algebraic parts, so exponential tails on fast oscillations, like that. Okay, and in general, you could also def define Wn of x1, xn to be the expectation value of a product of trace of xi minus m and minus 1, and plus y to n. You take the cumulant uh, and multiply by product of dxi's to make it an n form, a symmetric n form, so it's really a tensor product. Uh, and again, you want to compute that Wn of x1, xn. You would like to write it as sum from g equals 0 to infinity of h bar to the 2g minus 2 plus n, Wgn of x1, xn, plus non perturbative part. So here also you have a non perturbative part.
And well, another expectation value you can be interested in is typically uh, the expectation value of, let's say, uh, um, characteristic polynomial. And it will be what we shall call psi h power of x. So it will be that psi. <coughs> Right, and just to show you the relationship between this and that, <coughs> uh, here, well, observe that expectation value of determinant of x minus n is the same thing as expectation value of exponential <coughs> trace log x minus n, okay, which is the same thing as expectation value of exponential integral dx prime over x minus x, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, trace <coughs> of, no, no. dx prime uh, up to x prime, or let's say from infinity uh, of trace of 1 over x prime minus m, so we put dx prime here. I can like write words up to x, right? Uh, and if you think about what the cumulant means, the cumulant means exactly that this is exponential uh, sum over n of, uh, I mean, what you should do is expand the exponential into sum of uh, 1 over k factorial, and you will have k terms like that, so a certain number of them. And uh, the thing that is that this is exactly sum over n of 1 over n factorial integral of infinity to x, infinity to x of this wn of x prime 1, x prime n. Okay. So it's just to show you that indeed the polynomial, the, the, <coughs> the expectation value of orthogonal polynomials is given by such a formula. So I mean, basically, once you know how to compute the expansion of Wn, so the coefficients are Wgn, you just put them in the formula there, and you get the formula I wrote. Okay. So it's uh, very simple things. While sometimes you want to, I mean, here I was integrating from infinity, but if you take the ratio of two orthogonal polynomials, so I can <coughs> write it x, uh, well, let me write a divisor x minus y. Okay. Let me write it as a divisor, so determinant of y minus m. So it's minus log of y minus m. So it's the same thing as integrating from y to x. So it's just the same thing. And that's what I would call a divisor. Integrating on the device. Uh, okay, so now let me go to the third part. So somehow around the matrices, where the motivation. So by solving Schrodinger's Dyson equation, you find a, re a recursion relation among the WGNs. You find a recursion relation among the WGNs, and back recursion relation is universal. It does not depend on which measure you started with. It does not depend on which type of random matrix you started with. It's totally universal. And the only data that it needs is to know the W01. So that's basically all the data which you need. It's that curve which is there. So there is a universal recursion. Universal recursion, uh, which, uh, which computes every WGN, or every G on N, from W01, and in fact from also from W02, but also in random matrices, W02 is de determined by W01. So in fact, uh, well, in principle, you need the two. But in random matrices, uh, one is determined by the other. 
So let me take another example which does not seem to be, I mean, which does not seem to be related to a matrix integral of that type. In fact, it's related to a matrix integral which was introduced by Maxim, so a conceived integral. But let me not define it that way. Let me start with module spaces, uh, well, intersection number. So intersection numbers, so let's first consider MGN, which is the moduli space, uh, moduli space of Riemann surfaces with n uh, of genus G with n mark points. So it's objects like that, in genus G, and you have n mark points, let's call them 1, 2, n, okay? So it's the set of, uh, so it's the set of Riemann surfaces which I would call C, P1, Pns, and modulo is a morphisms. Uh, well, this space is not compact because when, <coughs> for instance, when a cycle gets, when you take a family of, of such, uh, such curves, a cycle can get pinched in the limit and it's no more uh, remains a smooth remains surface. So we define the compactified moduli space of, re of, re of Riemann surfaces, but now you shall allow also nodal stable. Nodal means that it can be a Riemann surface made of several pieces like that, uh, connected by a nodal point. Uh, you can have also things like that. Okay, and stability means that every component uh, must have uh, Euler characteristic strictly negative. So for instance here it's a sphere with two nodal points, so it's not stable. Uh, Euler characteristic is zero. Uh, so we shall we need to take a third nodal point for instance. Or, or, or have some genius so I mean, this one is stable. Right? Uh, and on that space we can define the cotangent line bundle. So Li uh, is the cotangent line bundle, well, cotangent bundle at mark points at pi, at the i mark point. So it means it's a, it's a bundle over MGN bar whose fiber is the cotangent space of C. Uh, so whose fiber, uh, so the fiber is uh, C star C uh, at point Pi. Right? Such a cotangent <coughs> bundle, for such a cotangent bundle, you can define the Chan class, um, which we shall not. Psi i equals the chunk class of Li. I will not explain how to compute the chunk class, but it is a two form in MGN bar. So it's a two form um, MGN bar. And that means that you can compute integrals over MGN bar of psi 1 to d to the power d1, psi n to the power dn, something like that. It makes sense only if uh, you have a form which is of the same uh, degree as the, as the dimension of your space. So we shall define tau d1 tau dn. So this is a notation. Uh, so if sum of di is 3g minus 3 plus n, and we shall also say that it's zero otherwise. Okay? So that shows the definition. And now the question is how to compute this. And we shall make uh, generating functions.
So the written conjecture said that if you put those numbers together to form a certain generating function, that generating function will be the KDV tau function. Uh, it satisfies the, the KDV hierarchy. Uh, this was proved by Maxine. Uh, but here we shall use something else. We shall use another way of writing a generating function for that, which is not directly the, the, tau, fun the tau function of a KDV, but something else. So let me define WGN of Z1, Zn the sum over d1 dn. Let me put the 2 to the 2 minus 2g minus n in front. Uh, product from i equals 1 to n of 2di plus 1 double factorial over zi to the 2di plus 2. I will make them differential form, so I multiply by dzi on here. Those numbers tau d1 tau dn g. Okay, in fact, let me do something somewhere tk tau k plus 1 g. Let me add some extra parameters. So it will be, there will be some redundancy. And then wgn will be, uh, will also become the times t. So that's a generating function which I designed for those numbers. Uh, well, uh, just one remark here. I denote the index g for the genus. I don't write the index n because n is just the number of tau factors. So when I write this notation, this means that you should, uh, in fact, do the Taylor expansion of the exponential. Right? So tk, yes, tk, tau k plus 1. Okay. So it's just redundant. So either I put all the times tk's to 0. If I put all the times tk's to 0, I already have a good generating function for all intersection <coughs> numbers. I could also, let's say, take all the zi's going to infinity, or well, which would correspond to take all the d's to 0 here. Um, then this would also be a good generating function for intersection numbers. Well, it's a matter of choice. I mean, so somehow there is a redundancy between the t's and the z's. But let me keep them for the moment. I mean, we can do the more, can also do the less. So, uh, <laughs> so what are the tau k plus 1? So tau, tau's are the same symbols as here. So I'm, I'm just going to explain what it means. So let me give the example. So, So, uh, Here. Uh, let me start here. I just explain what that means. Uh, so, for instance, let's do the example of W11. It depends on a univariable Z1 on the family of times. <coughs> two to the, so it's 2 to the minus 1, sum over Z. 2D uh, plus 1 to the factorial over Z to the Z1 to the 2T plus 2 dz times tau d exponential sum over k of tk tau k plus 1 g and remember that we start with k larger than 1 here so what this means is that you should expand that into sum over n of 1 over n factorial 
uh, well, this to a power n. So let me write just the first few terms. So it's 1 plus t2, sorry, t1, t2 plus t1 square over 2 t2 square. Let's, let's say t2, t3, tau 3 plus 1. So you have, in principle, an infinite number of terms. But you can check that there is only a finite number of them which are such that sum of di is 3g minus 3 plus the number of tau factors. So there are, in fact, only exactly two of them which, would cause, which can uh, satisfy this requirement. And so what you will find is you have tau minus 1, so you have only the tau 1, 1 uh, plus so, uh, w so which would be with uh, so 3 over c4 dz1 plus, uh, and here you will have dz1 over z1 square, t1, tau 0, tau 2, 1. That's the only terms which remain when you take this sum of di equals 3g minus 3 percent. So this is just a convenient notation for a finite sum, in fact. And in fact, those numbers are known. It's 1 over 24, and this one is also 1 over 24. So which means this W11 of Z1 T is in fact uh, 1 over uh, 1 over 16 Dz1 over Z1 square. Let me write it this way: 1 over Z1 square plus T1 over 3. So that's by computing, for instance, chain classes or whatever. So, but there is a way to compute. Uh, there is there is a recursion satisfied by the WGNs. They satisfy a certain recursion, uh, which is the following: WGN plus one of let me write the variable C zero C n. So you have n plus one of n on the times <coughs> equals residue when a number of variables goes to zero of uh, something wrong. Um, so two z two z d z zero over z zero square minus z square. Uh, let me write that one over y of z minus y of minus z, I will write a new for the z, 1 over, let me write dx of z, and times uh, wz minus 1 and plus 2 of z minus z, z1, zl, plus sum from, uh, so, g, well, h plus h prime equals g, on i of product w h one plus cardinal i uh, z i w h prime one plus cardinal of i prime minus z i prime close the brackets and here I will put a prime the prime here means that you should exclude exclude the, the, the exclude the the choices that would produce a, a w zero one. So every time you have h on for instance h equals zero on i empty set. This should be excluded from the sum, or, or if you have h prime equals zero and i prime empty set, this should be excluded from the sum. That's what this prime means. So you know, one w zero one. And I just have to write what is y of z. So y of z is minus z plus one half sum over k equals one to infinity uh, t k. 2 to the k over 2k plus 1 double factorial, so it's the product of odd numbers, <coughs> z to the 2k plus 
this one. All right, on x of z equals z squared. So, uh, so there is something which probably you find strange. There is a dx in the denominator. That may look strange, but remember that w is a, is a one form in each of its variables. So here you have twice the variable z, so it's a quadratic differential. Divided by dx, it becomes a one form. So it makes sense to compute the residue of a one form. So it's a quadratic differential divided by one form. It's OK. I mean, so that's what you need, in fact. So, uh, so the intersection numbers do satisfy this recursion, which is more or less equivalent to the Virazo constraints. And well, there are many ways to prove that. Uh, one is using uh, the Konsevich integral. Uh, one is using uh, the decomposition into Strebel graphs, uh, which uh, Maxine used also on just the combinatorics on the Strebel graphs. It's like uh, doing uh, cutting edges on, well, basically you can prove this recursion just by combinatorics. Uh, so there are many proofs of that. Uh, and so they do obey that recursion, and this is a special case of the topological recursion. You see, it takes the same structure as I was displayed here. And let me do an explicit example uh, just to show that this is really, uh, I mean, this is really computable. Uh, well, another, another thing, yeah, no, just another remark. Uh, this is, this Recursion does indeed compute everything, just starting from W. Oh, sorry, I forgot to write W02. W02 of C C2 is DZ1 DZ2 over Z1 minus Z2 to the square. Okay, so uh, yes, because in, the, in this recursion, uh, the value of 2G minus 2 plus N is always strictly lower in the right-hand side than in the left-hand side. So it's decreasing, and eventually you always arrive at W02 in, in uh, 2G minus 2 plus n steps. So it really confuses things. Um, let me give you the example of uh, W11, of Z1, of Z0, no, of Z0 with my notation. It's residue when z goes to 0 of 2z, this is 0 over z0 square minus z square. 1 over, well, here, let me replace that my minus 2z, uh, 1 minus t1 over 3, z square plus, no. I'm going to write the rest. And, double, and here, in that bracket, well, you can check that this prime, in fact, excludes all possibilities for that term. And the only term which remains is this, this one. Since you have g equals 1 on n equals 0, that corresponds to w0, 2 of z and minus z. OK? Uh, which is, uh, oh, sorry, and I forgot the 1 over t. 1 over dx is 2z dz dx on w0, 2 will be just dz times minus dz over 4z squared. Okay? You put all the, fact, all the powers of 2 in front, you also put the 1 over z0 squared in front, that's 1 over 16 z0 squared times residue when z equals to 0 of dz over z cube. Uh, so it will be 1 minus z square over z0 square to minus 1, and 1 minus t1 over 3 z square to minus 1, 1 plus all the other times to minus 1. But that residue is very easy to compute, and it is 1 over 16 z0 square. I forgot there was a dz0 also in front, in factor. Uh, and I must have forgotten a factor of 2 somewhere. So if I in fact find the 1 over n, yes, I have forgotten the 1 over 2. Uh, 
truly false, <coughs> sorry. 1 over 16 is your square, and what you find is indeed, uh, so this is your, uh, so 1 over 6 is your square, plus 1 over 3, which coincides with that. So just to show that you can redo computation by hand, it's, this recursion is extremely easy to use, it's a very simple example of a topological recursion, and it gives a correct answer, of course. Uh, so, okay. I'll probably stop very soon. Uh, I just want to write what is psi in that case. So you see that whenever it computes. Whenever you compute, uh, well, oh, yeah, well, it's easy to see that every WGN will be a rational function of uh, of its variables. So WGN will be a rational function, uh, will be a rational of the z guys. And let's define, let's compute integral from, let's say, infinity to z. Uh, in each variable of WGN, so you integrate each variable, multiply by h bar to the 2 g minus 2 plus n over n factorial, take the, ex take the sum over g and n, take the exponential of that, call that psi h bar of z, well, call that psi h bar of x, where I remind that x was z squared. Okay, um, let's compute the first two terms. It's minus, sorry, it's two thirds. Uh, sorry. So minus two thirds. Of, uh, so let, let's compute it in the case where all the t's are zero. <coughs> so it's minus two thirds x to the three half over h bar. You have 1 over square root, so sorry, 2x to the power 1 over 4. So it's typically a WKB expansion. Uh, and you then you have expansion minus 5h power over 48x to the 3 half plus blah blah blah. I mean 5 over 64, 5h bar square over 48x cubed plus. Okay, you can compute this expansion by hand. Is it with the x after the z? In Sorry? The here? In the middle term. So where is the x in the middle term? Here. Oh, here. Th that's z. You integrate up to z, and then you replace z by the square root of x. Uh, oh, so that's why you have half integer powers of x here, oh, because they are, in fact, a rational function of z. So you see, well, so now let's compute uh, h bar squared d psi over d2 psi over dx squared, well, 1 over psi. <coughs> when you do that, you could expect to get a formal power series in h bar. Uh, you, you, you can expect to get a formal power series in h bar, and each term should be a, a negative powers of x, should contain possibly negative powers of x. But so you compute, you can compute by a hand. The first term you find x. And the second term, which would contain h bar, you find 0. The h bar square, you find 0. Well, so in fact, the answer is just x. <coughs> and that's the full answer. And you can prove it from the question. No way. So, time side. Sorry? Yeah, I'll put one outside before. So how uh, we so, uh, so it means it satisfies a second order uh, differential equation, which is the, so it just means that it's the airy function. So psi of x is just airy of uh, h bar to the minus two thirds x, is that this way, or plus two thirds? Uh, well, OK. 
okay? It's very functional. And uh, it also, um, there is another way to write that is introduce again y hat equals h bar dx. What we have found is that y hat square minus x psi equals zero. And remember what I wrote x on y upstairs. So when all the times are zero, you have y equals <coughs> z and x equals z square. And you can check that y square minus x equals zero. So you see, that's the curve we started with to run the recursion. <coughs> and we end up with uh, a quantized version of the curve annihilating psi, which in this case is very different function. Uh, I can just say what happens when you put, well, when you put, <coughs> let's say, t1 now different from 0. If you put t1 different from 0, you can define the same psi. <coughs> uh, here you will have an extra term which will be t1 times probably something with uh, power uh, minus t1 over 5, minus t1 over 5. Sorry, let's put the one over h bar here, two thirds, so that's <coughs> five half. Okay. And here, I mean, you can compute all the terms here. And then psi will be animated by an operator which will be slightly more complicated. It will no longer be the array function. So here, uh, in the h bar term, uh, you will have something. Well, you will have something depending on T1, uh, which I'm not going to write, but you can compute all terms like that. Mm -hmm. You just uh, integrate the WGNs. And what you find is that there is still an operator animating Psi, but it's more complicated. More complicated. Well, just let me write that this is minus T1 over 3 Z cube. So the equation is no longer that one. The equation is now Y square minus t1 square over 9 uh, x times x minus 3 over t1 uh, to the square equals 0. So now this is the classical curve. And what will be the operator annihilating psi? Well, the operator annihilating psi will look a little bit like that. It will be so y hat square minus t1 square over 9 well, let me write it x minus u to the square x minus 6 over t1 plus 2u. Okay, and multiply by x minus u plus, sorry, minus h bar y hat plus h bar square times a polynomial of the root 2 of x, which I'm not going to write, but which does not contain y. Equals zero. So you have a certain operator annihilating psi, and it's very explicit. And u, u is a power series in h bar, and it's uh, something like three over t one minus h bar square t one square over forty eight, well plus o of h bar four. In fact, it's a power series in h bar square. And it's not a completely arbitrary power series. It is a solution to a power of one equation. So let me uh, write it this way. Minus 6 over t1 plus 3 times 3 h bar over 2 t1 to the power 2 over 5 v of s, where with s is just a parameterization of h bar. 4 h bar to the minus 4 over 5, 2 t1 over 3, over minus 6 over 5. And then this v satisfies the part of the one equation. So v square minus 2 v seconds equals s. So that gives the expansion of u into powers of h bar square. And so, uh, so you see that. Well, there is an operator annihilating psi, and when you take the h bar going to zero limit, this term and that term disappear, so you get a curve which is factor factorized, it's just a factor. 
And if you replace to the leaning order u by 3 over t1, uh, if you replace u by 3 over t1, this just becomes x times x minus 3 over t1 to the square. So indeed, the large of uh, the h bar going to zero limit of that curve, of that quantum curve, and this contains that one as a factor. So it will be very similar to what happens in knot theory. Uh, we will start from a classical curve, which, will, which is in fact just a factor into the quantum curve. Uh, so I will, uh, oh no, okay, ju just to finish. Uh, so in that case, psi is not the uh, is not the area function. It's not such a simple function. It's more complicated, but it is related to this pan of a one equation. So this is the pan of a one equation. This is related to the pan of a one equation, and it uh, corresponds to saying that z, the partition function on psi, are deeply connected to the pan of a one. Uh, uh, to a nonlinear equation related to pi over one, and it, which is a reduction of a KDV hierarchy, and in fact it's related to a KDV uh, to the fact that the full partition function with all the times is the KDV top function. So okay, uh, let's make a break now, maybe. So then start again. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so now I'm going to give the definition of the topological recursion because so far I was just writing an example. Uh, so the, the definition. So it's my part number uh, four. 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 Mm -hmm. four. Uh, so I will start by defining what I call spectral curve. You see, in those examples, I had a function x of z, a function y of z, a w zero two, which was a one one form with a double pole, uh, and so. The spectral curve will contain all those in ingredients. The spectral curve, sorry, which I would call S, will contain a Riemann surface sigma. It will contain for the moment a function x, a function y, but in fact what I will be more interested in is that eta, which I will write, I mean, the one for y dx, which I will call eta, and another object which I will call b, I'm going to explain in uh, a minute what it is. So let me just write this eta, B. So sigma is a Riemann surface. Sigma will be a Riemann surface. Well, basically, it's where the, Z's, the Z variables live. And in the, examples, uh, in the example above, uh, Z were just complex numbers. So my example was just C, a complex plane. Or, or the complex plane compactified, so Riemann sphere, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but so it's a Riemann surface, and it's not necessarily not necessarily connected or compact. So I don't care whether it's compact, connected, or not. So typically, it can be a collection of disks. So it can typically be a collection of disks. Can have boundaries. Can it can have boundaries. It can be also, uh, it can be a, a natural, nice, smooth, compact to a surface. Okay? Uh, but it can be more or less anything you want. And it has mark points? Yes, it will have mark points, which shall be the zeros of dx. <coughs> so x will be a map from sigma. Well, for the moment, let's say it's a map from sigma to c, but in fact, later <coughs> it will also be a map sigma to another Riemann surface, which I would call the base. So it's a map from sigma to uh, a base, which I would call sigma zero, which could also have some genus, possibly. And again, it need not be compact, or I mean, it can, it can also be a collection of disks, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and such that um, it's analytical, so holomorphic map. <coughs> so holomorphic in sigma, so it's holomorphic on a series of disks. So you see upstairs it was x equals z squared. And locally, and well, no, sorry, the zeros of the x, <coughs> the x are the ramification points. So 
So let's call R, which is A1, AM, the ramification points. And so indeed, they are special points, A1, for instance, A2, <coughs> A3, and so on. And locally, near A, uh, X is not analytically invertible, because the X vanishes, so it means that uh, X, X is not, well, X is not one to one, it's typically two to one, or three to one, or whatever. So X is typically, so in the vicinity of each AI, X uh, is not uh, one to one, but it's typically two to one. Um, the, for generic branch, for generic ramification points, X is typically uh, two to one, or it can be, uh, or it can be uh, R A to one. Well, R A is the degree of the ramification point. So the number of points is finite. Yeah. Sorry. Number of ramification points is finite. Yes, we take a number of ramification points which is finite. We have an extension where it can be, uh, where we can integrate over the set. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take. But, but for a moment, uh, let's take finite. Yes. What guarantees that? Sorry? What, what, That's what, what condition makes, uh, makes sure that you have finite? Numbers? Well, typically, if uh, sigma is a compact human surface and x is uh, meromorphic, then it's finite. I mean, if the surface is compact, typically you will have finite number. Uh, so, then eta is a one form on sigma. So, on near, we shall also consider its uh, <coughs> expansion near ramification points, which we shall write eta of z in the vicinity of the of ramification point. We shall write its Taylor expansion, so T A K, so sum over K. So, well, let me put the T T down because they are not exactly the same times as before. Um, so, t, uh, so let me write that X of Z minus X of A to the power K over, well, K over 2 if it's a simple ramification point because uh, this would be a I mean, the square root of x of z minus x of a is a good local coordinate near, near a simple branch point. And if the branch point has higher degree, let's write tk over ra, uh, so for a higher order ramification points. And in fact, uh, what we need for eta is not really a one form, what we, uh, um, so times dx, okay, to make it a one form. So what we need for eta is not really one form. What we need is just a formal one form. So formal. So let me write it formal. <coughs> and eta is what very often we shall write y dx. When x, for instance, leaves a, when x, the base for x is the complex plane, then uh, y is by definition eta over dx. But I mean, but in a good local, I mean, if you take a choice of local coordinates, you can also always define y this way. So what you need is only formal series, because what we are going to do is only computing residues. So we have no need of, I mean, a residue will just pick a finite number of terms in the Taylor expansion. So you don't care about convergence. And then the last thing Sorry. Sorry. Why, it, I mean, why that, that means that you want to really this form to live on the base? Uh, no, why, no, it no. lives on the curve upstairs. We don't have formal neighborhoods of ramification yes, points. Yes, so, so in fact, yeah. So it yeah. lives on formal neighborhoods of ramification points. But so there's no connection, you don't impose connection between eta near A1 and eta no. near A2? No. Okay, so there's no analytic continuation? No. That, that's why I say it's a collection of disks are not necessarily connected. I mean, you will have more properties when they, can, when they are all on the same, let's say, compact human surface. You will have more properties, but everything will be well defined if there is no connection at all. So on B of Z1, Z2, uh, will be, um, B, B will be a one one form on sigma square. Uh, well, so um, with a double pole, double pole on the diagonal. 
So which means that locally B, you can write it B, Z1, Z2 uh, equals 1, Z1 going to Z2, like Z1, Z2 over Z1 minus Z2 to the square plus uh, <coughs> plus uh, holomorphic at Z1 equals Z2. So, I mean, you can take any such form. So, technically, I would say that B, well, by this product, what I really mean is really a tensor product. So, it means it's a one form in the Z1 variable whose coefficient is a one form in the Z, in the Z2 variable. So, it's really a tensor product. Um, in particular, it's symmetric. It is not, uh, not anti-symmetric. It's symmetric. Yeah, so, it's, it's not, sorry, and I, I require that it's symmetric. So, technically, B, I would say, belongs to sigma square uh, k sigma. I think usually mathematicians write the tensor product with a box <coughs> like that to say that it's uh, uh, for each factor. I mean, it's um, it belongs to the canonical bundle for for, for the first uh, for factor in the first projection times canonical bundle in the second projection. Mm -hmm. And let's say to say that there is a double pole on the diagonal. Delta is the diagonal, so let's write it this way. Uh, so it's neuromorphic. Sorry, um, so you want it neuromorphic. Sorry, hold on. No, yes, neuromorphic because there is a double pole. All right, and no other pole. All right, so there is not a unique choice of such a B. But when you have a compact Riemann surface, there is a more or less canonical choice of such a B, which is B from the head kernel on the Riemann surface, so from the uh, green function. So there is a one more or less canonical. I don't want to talk about the details, but so that's all the ingredients you need to define the topological recursion. <coughs> so now the topological recursion will be more or less the same formula I was writing upstairs. So imagine, so first imagine that, uh, so for two <coughs> definition of uh, TR. So let's first take, assume that all branch points are simple, simple branch points, uh, simple ramification points. <coughs> so it means that X is locally 2 to 1. We are HA, um, which means that, uh, so if you want, when you have, let me write this way, so x lives on uh, sigma 0, and the curve sigma is somewhere like that. So instead of writing surfaces and uh, in C cross C, I just write uh, curves in R cross R. And near a uh, ramification point, if you take Z near a ramification point, which project to x of z. There is another point here, which I will write sigma a of z, which is just the point on the other branch. It's not necessarily defined globally, it's defined only in a small vicinity of a. And you, you see that if, if you analytically continue z to the other branch point, sigma a will not analytically continue to the your, uh, and sigma a, we will call it the local Galois evolution. <coughs> so in fact, the local Galois group for such, uh, so it means that the local Galois group uh, is this Z2, mm, basically it's the only group with two elements. Mm -hmm. uh, but for higher order ramification points, you can have uh, higher uh, order Galois groups. Um, in fact, the, for the, the formula for arbitrary uh, uh, ramification points involves local Galois groups. So, but let me start with simple, <coughs> the simple case. So we shall define WG, W01 will be eta by definition, W02 will be B by definition, 
and W G n plus one of Z zero Z n will be sum over A all over identification points, residue when Z goes to A of a kernel which I will write K Z K A zero Z uh, of uh, W G n plus n minus one and plus two of z, c my of z, c1, cn, plus, well, it's more or less the same formula as above, h plus h prime equals g, i, i prime equals z1, cn, some prime, so I want no w is your one factor, wh1 plus i of z, i, w h prime of 1 plus i prime, sigma i of z, i prime. Okay, it just remains to write what is k a. k a of z 0 z prime, z is uh, 1 half of integral from sigma i of z to z of w 0 to of z0. So the variable I integrate technically is z prime. So you integrate in the vicinity of A. So you integrate in a <coughs> graph which lies in the vicinity of A. And divide it by w0 1 of z minus w0 1 of c mi of z. Yeah, so c mi is such that x c mi equals x. And we choose the one which is not identity. Okay. So that's the definition. Now there is something <coughs> a little bit strange in that definition. So you can check that this definition will define at each step uh, one form, uh, so yes, one form in each variable. So in fact, WGN, WGN uh, belongs to H0 of sigma n uh, to product of n of k sigma. Uh, and in fact, there is, uh, well, you see that z0, z0 appears only there, and it appears nowhere else. Whereas z1, zn's appear there in a symmetric way. But so z0 seems to play a totally different role. You can prove by, by recursion that what you get is always symmetric. Uh, in all the variables. So it is proved just by recursion. It's not totally one. Well, it's not so difficult. But, uh, but it's not <coughs> obvious from the definition, but it has the property that it's always symmetric. And what about the poles? And the poles, yes, I'm coming to the poles. Yeah, so the poles. So if 2g minus 2 plus n is strictly positive, the poles are only at R, at ramification points. So there is no pole in particular when two of the ZIs coincide or things like that. There is no poles on the diagonals, uh, except for W02, which has a pole on the diagonal by definition. On W01 also, it, has, it may have poles elsewhere. Uh, W01, as I said, is, uh, is <coughs> can be a formal series. It even can be uh, totally uh, with uh, essential similarities, uh, totally horrible. And, uh, and there is no residue. All residues vanish. So, so the, the singularities of W0 and do not uh, no. translate into Well, you see, because of that prime, there is no W0 one. And the W0 one appears only in the denominator, but you use it only to compute residues, so it means you compute only, you, you need a, each time you always need only a finite number of terms in this one. So then, um, then I want to define uh, <coughs> Fg, which is Wg0. And uh, because in this formula, I always have at least one here. So uh, I, this formula will never compute Wg0. And for g <coughs> larger than 2, we define it as 1 over 2 minus 2g, uh, sum over 
L in R where we do and Z goes to A of W G one of Z phi of Z where D phi is W zero one. So you take any integral of W zero one multiply it by WG1, which you have completed from over there, take residues, sum over poles, divide by 2 minus 2G, that gives FG. Uh, this, well, it does not depend on which choice of phi you make, because the residues vanish. So if you add a constant to phi, that does not change the result. Uh, so that's the definition. Well, I will not write the definition of F0 and F1. Uh, they are, it will take me uh, the full hour to uh, just write the definition of F0 and F1, but uh, you can find it in the literature. Uh, so, all right. So, those objects have many, many properties. Well, as I said, uh, sorry, you know, I prefer to take the last. So I'm not going to write <coughs> no, in, fact, uh, in fact yeah. so as I said uh, this recursion can be also I mean it's easy to, to write this recursion when the local Galois group is not Z2 so when the ramification points are, are higher order and I think that, uh, that's what Dimas Fontin will use this afternoon uh, curves with higher order ramification points uh, well, here you should replace this by a product of all elements of the local Galois group. And I mean, there is a generalized form that which corresponds to arbitrary ramification points. Um, so, uh, let me enumerate some properties and then show how it's related to moduli spaces. So uh, as I said, this recursion solves basically the large end expansion of many kinds of matrix models. It computes also the, the number of uh, maps in combinatorics uh, of uh, arbitrary genus. And, uh, well, um, it, computes, uh, well, it computes many things. It's related to of written invariants, uh, to not theory, to many things. So but let me go to some properties. So one property, as I said, is uh, the symmetry. I already, already wrote that. So another property is why we call them invariants. Invariant of what? Well, they are what I will call syntactic invariants. Syntactic invariants, by that I mean that when you take the curve x, y, so your curve x, y is something like that. You have a projection x. Uh, let me assume for the moment that the base is, uh, is c, and it's c. Okay. Uh, then uh, you see that when we do the computation, we compute things at the ramification points, which are the points where the tangent is vertical. We compute residue at those points. Imagine now that we make a rotation. Okay, so we project in a different direction. Okay, well, so we make a rotation, so we choose two new coordinates of, of C cross C, mm -hmm. and we choose them such that uh, x, so dx was dy equals dx tilde was dy tilde. So it's not, I mean, rotation is only a special case, but in fact, let's consider symplectomorphisms, so which conserve the, the symplectic form. Then uh, it's not obvious, but the, but the FGs are unchanged when you do that. So FGs conserved by symplectomorphisms. But this is on the low for small deformations, right? No, no, it's for also large deformations. So for large deformations, your branch points could run away from the disks, for example, if you have a collection okay, of disks in okay. your picture. Okay, I should say, okay, but it's just that I'm not finished saying this. Okay, this is proved 
proved only if on sigma compact and x on y neuromorphic and uh, with some extra little assumptions basically saying that there is no degeneracy, no de degeneracy in the branch points. Okay. Uh, so you mean why is now well defined as a, as a neuromorphic uh, yeah, form? So, yes, so okay. now it's really well defined neuromorphic form. So this is proved in that case. We believe that it should be true in a mo much more general setting, but we have no proof of that. So you okay. cannot prove it for small deformations by looking at... No, the for instance, for the moment, we have not been able to prove this from small deformations, from a small deformation method. So we, we don't know how to prove that in general. We believe that for the curves which appear in gromov Houghton theory, uh, this should be true, but this does not alter that... Uh, that framework. So we believe it should be true, but we have no proof. So here it is for sigma, it is because the sigma has a projective curve, right? And sigma yes. one? Yes. Do you have a, um, when sigma, sigma naught is something different, do you have also? Well, we believe that there is something, a property like that, but we have not been able to prove it. So, um, So another important property uh, regards indeed small deformations. So if you have a family of spectral curves, <coughs> so all of them also, well, no, excuse me, just, just uh, one more thing. In the case where the curve, uh, when the base curve is not the complex plane, the correct way of looking at spectral curve is saying that you have, so you have your base curve, you have a projection sigma, uh, sorry, you have your base curve, and uh, the eta, so the curve is not really x on y, it's really x on eta, and eta lives in the cotangent uh, bundle of, uh, of sigma zero, so you have, and uh, the curve now is embedded, well, immersed, let's say, into the cotangent bundle of sigma zero. That's really what we consider to be a spectral curve, and x is that map. And here we have, you have a canonical projection. And typically, you can choose eta to be the pullback by i of the topological form in t star zero, sigma zero. There is a symplectic structure on that space. And what we mean by symplectic invariance should be the symplectic invariance under symplectic transformation in the system. But again, that's not proved for fully general case. So basically, that's proved when sigma zero has gene zero. But I mean, it's yeah, what does mean? So you should <coughs> you don't change beta. I. Sorry. Okay. You don't change b. B don't change b. B is. Uh, yes. This is not related to a projection. Uh, so, uh, so now let me consider something else. It's small deformations. So you have a curve like that. So you have a curve at time t, <coughs> and you have another curve at time t prime. But it's really, I mean, you, you change everything. You change the functions x, eta, b, but you also change the complex structure of the curve itself. I mean, you really change everything. So, uh, question, you would like to compute d over dt of the things. Well, you would like to compute d over dt of wgn. Well, let's start by defining, well, let's start saying that w dt of any function, well, in order to be able to define d over dt, since, since the variables will live in different spaces, different, uh, on different curves, you have to, tell, to explain what you mean by that. So when you have a point z here, on the point z prime, uh, on the point z on the curve t prime, what you should do is push it to a base, then uh, pull it back to the other curve. Ah, so base is not changing. Yes, base is not changing. Yes, base fixed. So, uh, so what you mean by that is the limit when epsilon goes to zero of one over epsilon f uh, f let's say t plus epsilon sorry so it's x t minus one x t plus epsilon uh, the pullback of f t 
plus epsilon minus ft. Maybe it's something like that, if I, not, okay, I hope I didn't write it wrong. Uh, but well, that's the idea. To compare two things, you put it back on the initial curve. So now compute the form omega t, which is dt of eta. I can compute it. And it's a one form, one form on sigma. It's typically a monomorphic one form on sigma. And it is dual, dual to a cycle. But I'm not using the point carré duality. I'm going to use another duality which is based on the B. And the duality which I will use is uh, I will require that omega t, uh, so uh, let me call that omega star t. Omega t, uh, and the duality is, well, the pairing is given by B, and you can write it as it's, uh, it's bt is a, one, is a one form in each variable, so you integrate one of the variables on the cycle and you get a one form. Okay. I don't want to interrupt this one. In fact, what you get is a one form, uh, sorry, well it means that the cycle omega star is defined up to the kernel of this map. But a good thing is that the omega gns vanish exactly on the corner. So, uh, so then, theorem, the theorem of deformations is that, uh, is that so uh, if, so, uh, if dt b t satisfies, uh, satisfies Range formula. I will explain in a second. Then, for every g on n, what we have is dt wgm is integral over this cycle of the star of wgn plus 1, where we integrate only the n plus 1 variable here. And saying that it satisfies the Rauch formula, is equivalent to say that this is this equality should be true for W0 too. So basically if the equality is true for W01 and W02, then it's true for every G and N. And that's extremely useful. I mean. So you, it can be used for instance to compute D over DTK uh, in the Konsevich uh, K in the intersection number of Ks, which I will Erased, but if you want to compute d over the decay here, you can use this theorem. It's extremely easy to use. And it's, uh, Sorry, it's omega star t. Yeah. It's omega star t. Well, so mm -hmm. it's, it really lives in the dual. It lives in the dual of uh, the one forms on sigma. So that's a neuromorphic one forms on sigma, dual. So it's yeah, a generalized is, notion of the idea to write it's omega star t. Excuse me. Uh, right here? Yes, okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, so it lives in the dual, and uh, in fact, modulo, uh, modulo the kernel of this uh, map, of the, of the map which to a cycle associated form. But, uh, I think that it has. But this quantity goes to a quotient. Right. Okay, I don't want to enter details of that, but it's just that it's, it's, it is in fact a way of generalizing the cyborg beaten equation. So, for instance, if you, if you apply that to uh, so, for instance, if you apply that to f zero, you see that the derivative of f zero is some integral of w zero one, which is your eta. Well, basically, this is cycle with an equation. All right. Uh, so now the property I want to concentrate on is related to the to the modular spaces that we do at the end. Well, whenever you have a recursion, 
combinatorists know that the best way to write a recursion is by writing graphs, writing it in terms of graphs. And in fact, most of those theorems can be proved just by combinatorics of graphs. And in fact, by also saying what it means that computing a residue, computing a residue means you take all your functions, you expand them into power series, pick some uh, coefficients, and that's very well encoded by combinatorics. And using combinatorics, you can arrive to, uh, to a, so link to mobility spaces. <coughs> So what I was mentioning at the beginning, there always exists a certain moduli space such that omega gn is an integral of that moduli space. So let me define mvn of s uh, will be, uh, so let me assume that we have n branch points. So let me uh, assume that we have n, n ramification points. So our moduli space will be a set of Riemann surfaces uh, with mark points, P1, sorry, that's uh, P1, Pn, and with, uh, we call it a color, uh, a color, let me call it S. So, uh, well, it will be, I mean, well, normally this is more or less the Gromov-Witten theory of, uh, of a graph of a complete graph with m points. So what I mean by that is a space of nodal Riemann surfaces uh, with, well, the edges, I will write them as just spheres with two points. I mean, that's the localization graph which you find in uh, a common frequency. Uh, and you have mark points, things like that, so we have one, two, three mark points. So it's a moduli space. On each piece, there is a color. So let's say this one has color one. Uh, this one will have color two. And this one can have color three. Well, several pieces can have the same color, that's not a problem. You can also have some things like that. Well, so that's, so the nodal, uh, our, so it's a space of uh, nodal curves. So you, you can also write it as a space of curves with a function from S to the graph, with, uh, to the complete graph with n points. <coughs> so here, uh, for this example, we have three points, one, two, three. And so it maps from a Riemann surface to that graph. So each of those things is mapped to vertex, each of those is mapped to a to an edge. Okay. I mean, it's exactly the localization of graphs in a common Fulton theory. So, uh, and then I will define a cohomology class in each strata. So, uh, so strata are given by graph. The graph corresponding to that is just the graph of having a vertex. Uh, so it's basically you, you replace these by edges and these things by vertices. Uh, so this one has also two external legs. So <coughs> one edge. <coughs> so we have three vertices. This one has a, a leg like that. It has an external leg. It has a leg that, like that. Okay. And at each vertex, you re re recall the genus. So it's here. It was three. So, so I didn't, didn't get. You have kind of sphere with two mark points with no color. Yeah? <coughs> Sorry. You have uncolored. Components. Yes. Yes. You have uncolored pieces which have which are just spheres with yeah. two two mark points. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but usually stable curves you say. We yeah. contract them, but you don't contract them. Mm, yes. in, in some of them, we contract I mean, some. It's just a uh, uh, combinatorial descri description, so uh, uh, <coughs> okay, I, I would rely on you to really make a precise definition of that, but for the mm -hmm. moment, it's just uncut by graphs. Yeah. I mean, it's just the degeneration. Um, no, but the, the, the degeneration graph, it's, uh, uh, so it's not stable curve. No. Each of those pieces is stable curve. Ah. Ah. 
So each piece is table curve. So basically, I'm defining the, the module space by its strata. And each strata is encoded by a graph. So here you have genes 1 and 2 edges. Here you have genes 1 and 4 edges. And you also recall the color. So if here you have color 1, uh, color 2, and color 3, that example. Okay, and you have your external leg, your external legs, which <coughs> are correspond to the mark points Q1, Q2, uh, Q3, for instance, Q1, Q2, Q3. Okay. So it means that each quota is, is a graph, and, uh, and to this graph, uh, well, you associate the product of our vertices of M, GV, and V bar. So the standard module spaces of Riemann surfaces with uh, n mark points, product of our vertices. Okay, and you, you shall define uh, a cohomology class on each strata, and the cohomology class on each strata will be the product of our vertices of exponential sum of t hat k. So. Uh, okay, uh, we cannot, can, sorry, let me write it this way, tau k plus 1 times product of our edges of, uh, so an edge is a pair of vertices, vg prime, and exponential 1 over 2, sum over k and l, b at a k, a v, k, a v prime l psi to the k psi prime to the l. Let me write it this way. Uh, okay. And uh, well, the the push forward of the tau classes of the chain classes which we defined before uh, under forgetful maps are also called kappa classes. So in fact. As to a small change over time, we can write it kappa cases like that. Okay, I will explain what it means. And then the theorem is that WGN of Z1, Zn, and that's really now for every spectral curve, uh, is an integral of this mg1. Well, there is 2 to the 3 g minus 3 plus n. Sum over d1 dn, integral over mg, this mgn of s, this lambda of s, times product from i equals 1 to m psi to di, and times product from i equals 1 to n psi li di of di. And where psi, psi ad of z is residue of b of z, z prime of x of z prime minus x of a to the power minus d minus one half and times uh, we shall multiply it by 2d plus 1 w factorial over 2 to the d just for convenience so then the minus sign Uh, the times t hat k's are basically correspond to the Taylor expansion of y, your branch point. But uh, I mean, that's when I was writing the taus, but transforming into the kappas, it's, uh, you should take the log. In fact. So uh, it means that the uh, t hat k, so let's define by, by our generating series, some over k of t hat k's. So I'm just writing the generating series. It's just a way to encode the Taylor expansion near the branch point. <coughs> so it's log minus log of the Laplace transforms, the Laplace transform of e to the minus ux over a steepest descent path which goes to branch point A. I will show an example in a, in a minute. And the coefficients b hat k, so and the coefficient b hat k 
L prime L are just again <coughs> Laplace, uh, sorry, the, the Taylor expansion of B uh, near uh, just correspond to the Taylor expansion of B, where the first variable is taken in the vicinity of A and the second variable in the vicinity of A prime. So this is just the question of the Taylor expansion. So which means, well, you can write it this way, V of Z1, Z2. Uh, when Z1 goes to A and Z2 goes to A prime. Uh, so I mean, you could write the coefficient as residues or write the expansion. So we work A on L of uh, B hat A K A prime L. And those uh, X of Z minus X of Z A. So X of Z1 minus X of A over K plus 1 over 2. And we like that. X of Z2 minus X of A prime. Mm -hmm. Uh, L plus 1 over 2. Well, okay, I'm, I'm probably forgetting times the x of z1, the x of z2. And well, there was also the double pole. Uh, okay, and here there is plus delta a a prime, the x uh, of z1, the x of z2 over x of z1 minus x of z2 to the square. Something like that. Okay. Uh, well, so they are just the questions in the Taylor expansion. Let me show you a very quick application of that. So, the idea is with that theorem, in fact, mm -hmm. that theorem is basically gives something which corresponds exactly to the uh, to the to the Gromov-Witten uh, to the gromov invariance. So basically, the gromov witten invariants always have that structure. So you see this theorem decomposes the WGM for every spectral curve into, a, into some sum over graphs. So what this theorem says is that we have a sum over graphs. And at each vertex, we take an integral of our standard moduli space MGN bar, so which is basically intersection numbers uh, of MGN bar. So this theorem, for instance, says that the partition function for every spectral curve can be decomposed as a certain operator acting on a product of k digital function. So, in fact, this is more or less nearly equivalent to the given type formalism. So, this was proved by uh, Dean Martin, uh, Oranta, Shadrin, and Spitz in 2013. Uh, well, I mean, this equivalence on this theorem I could be in fact in 2011. Well, I say that it's nearly equivalent to Givental because uh, to be really equivalent to Givental you need to have, I mean, the equivalence to Givental does not work for every spectral curve, it works only if W02 and W01 are related by a certain relationship. Otherwise, you cannot call it Givental, but this theorem is true nevertheless. But uh, you can call it Givental only if uh, well, that's what's called the R matrices of certain properties. Uh, so let me just show you a very quick application. So example, compute, take the curve uh, x equals z square on y equals sine 2 pi z. <coughs> well, okay. Uh, take that curve. So there is only one branch point which is at z equals zero. So there is only one branch point. So which means that our MGN of S is just the standard MGN bar. Mm. There is only one color, there is nothing we can do. And all the B hat k's are vanishing in that case also. Well, B of Z1, Z2 is Z Z1, Z Z2. Over Z1 minus Z2 to the square, there is no Taylor expansion, so there is no such term. And here, when you compute this, so uh, the only thing you have to compute is the Laplace transform. So if you compute the integral of y dx into a minus ux, uh, well, from, so this is just integral of, uh, so sine 2 pi z, so let's write it 1 over 2i e to the 2 pi i z minus e to the minus 2 pi i z 
uh, 2z dz into a minus uz square. This is, uh, well, you integrate from minus infinity to infinity. This is a Gaussian integral. I let you compute it. And um, it's very easy to see that you get into a minus pi square over u, well, times some uh, <coughs> times some u to the th three half, sorry, uh, square dot pi over u to the three half or something like that. So the actual uh, definition here, I, well, I mean, here I should say that you take the only the minus part of that when u is large. And when you take the minus part, so it means that you have only t. Uh, the only t, uh, the only t hat k which remains is uh, pi square delta k1. So it's the, the quotient of 1 over u, and you take mi minus the log of that, it's the quotient of 1 over u, and it's just pi square. So which means that for that curve, WGN, according to the theorem, is integral over MGN, bar of e to the pi square kappa 1. Uh, well, let's say WG0 is e to the pi square kappa 1, which is, uh, on e to the pi square kappa 1, it is the by Peterson volume on MGN bar. So it's the by Peterson volume. So, okay, I'm going fast, I know, but what we have proved here is that if you start with that curve, so the topological recursion of that curve gives the Weil-Pedersen volumes. And the topological recursion of that curve is exactly what's called the Mirzahani relation for the Weil-Pedersen volumes. So we have, <coughs> so this, so just as a way to say that this theorem, a very easy corollary of that theorem, is that the Weil-Pedersen volumes do obey Mirzahani recursion. So, so we have proved basically what we have proved is near Zarani's recursion using that theorem. You so said this is WG0 or WGN? Well, I, okay, I mean, if you want to write WGN, uh, you need to put the, the sum over with psi IDI, okay. I mean, it's just my time is over now, so I didn't want to write it for WGN, but, but indeed, uh, near Zarani's relation is for WGN, and you get the correct answer. So basically, what it implies is that five Peterson volumes obey <coughs> So that's a corollary of that theorem when you choose that curve. Well, you could choose any other curve, and so another corollary, another corollary is uh, you can take uh, x uh, toric Calibia of threefold. Uh, take the spectral curve to be the mirror of x and the mirror of x, so let's call it x hat is, is the mirror curve of x and it's typically given by an equation uh, p, uh, a polynomial equation of not x y equals 0 but of e to the x e to the y equals 0. Well, the mirror curve is typically given by that for every for example, if you take x equals c3, <coughs> so if you take x equals c3, what you will get is 1 plus, that would give you your curve, so very simple. Uh, so for c3, for well, the mirror of c3, uh, and out of that, basically you can say that this defines a spectral curve, you can run the topological recursion on it, and uh, the topological recursion, so on the WGNs, uh, so the corollary is that the WGN equals the common of return invariance. Of X. So <coughs> that's again a kind of corollary of that theorem. Well, it's not a totally trivial corollary, you have to work a uh, little bit with uh, combinatorics of graphs, but that's only combinatorics of graphs, nothing more. So I would like to thank you for your attention.